Okay. I was trying to come up with a title a long time ago, uh, decades ago, on what to call some of the information I share. And I, I really like what's new since 1492. It doesn't really have any deeper meaning than that. And I was at a church one time, and uh, I had given them that uh, information ahead of time, and they were, had put up little, little signs, but they, they misheard me, uh, not intentionally, they, they just misheard me. And what they had put on their signs was, what's nuisance, as a nuisance, since, what's nuisance, 1492? And I was thinking, well, that's a good place to start, so... Uh, I am a, a member of the Dakota tribe, and uh, membership means uh, you are usually connected to a specific reservation. And my reservation is the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. So my agenda for tonight, uh, part one, is number and kinds of tribes, uh, who's an Indian, tribal membership, tribal populations, Indian as a name, U.S. Constitutional Foundation of Tribal Sovereignty and Cultural Traditions. And then we'll get into part two next week. A uh, little personal background on uh, growing up Indian in Rapid City, South Dakota. The Barrel Model of Culture. It's an anthropological model and it works really well for the classes I teach. Personalities and Tribal Sovereignty focusing on casinos. And in part three, tribal government operations, poverty, cultural appropriation, focusing on mascots and product packaging, and finishing up with celebrations. So as we go through here, if you have some questions, uh, the chat room is open, and uh, we'll get those collected. And if it's appropriate to stop, we'll go through some of those things if we can. So what's new since 1492? Number and kinds of tribes. Culturally, there are about 300 tribes in America. These 300 tribes can be studied culturally by dividing them unequally into eight geographic groups within the United States. Those geographic groups are, are called cultural study areas, CSAs, mm -hmm. and that's what you'd find in a typical text. However, the legal definition of a tribe requires federal recognition. So the legal definition of a tribe is recognition by the federal government. When you use that definition, you expand the number of tribes to 573. And this is because one tribe can be made up of multiple subgroups within the tribe, the breakdown of the tribe, if you will, and each subgroup has federal recognition which means that each subgroup is considered a tribal government or a federal entity. For example, my cultural tribe is Dakota, but the Dakota have nine federally recognized tribal governments. There are four kinds of tribes in America, federally recognized only, which for the purposes of what we're talking about in this workshop is the legal definition federally recognized only, state recognized only, federal and state recognized, and unrecognized. The unrecognized is somewhat like a club. But what this means for the unrecognized, they are pretty much all the time trying to seek federal recognition because there are a lot of benefits to having that recognition. Federal and state, uh, some tribes are state recognized who would like to have federal recognition. So that's on how many kinds of tribes we are and I'm moving on to who is an Indian. So if you have a question, I'm gonna give you just uh, 15 seconds to think about it if you wanna send that in and we'll move on. So as we talk about who is an Indian, I have three definitions that I typically use. Um, blood biology, heritage, family tree is definition number one. Definition number two is cultural. And definition number three is legal. So the first definition, blood biology, heritage, family tree, 
that's when uh, you have a group of people and you say, hey, anybody here part Indian? And they raise their hand. That's the definition they're typically using. You don't have to have any proof. You just get to say it. When you ask somebody, uh, are you connected to a tribe or do you have a tribal history? Many times people who say they're Indian don't have a tribal connection. It's just missing. A lot of times it's missing because the great grandmother, the great great grandfather, whoever it may have been, the records are gone. They don't seem to know exactly. It's just the story they heard, part of the family tree. This definition is used by the Bureau of Census. The Bureau of Census is in the Department of Commerce and they are charged with counting people every 10 years because the constitution says that's what we have to do. So this is definition number one. Definition number two is cultural. This just means uh, you do Indian stuff. And Indian stuff can be everything from how you dress, uh, how you talk, the kind of food you eat, where you live, the kind of activities you engage in, uh, the things you do, uh, participate in, etc. So culturally defined by a display or expression of cultural behaviors, beliefs, and values. Um, you usually have to learn a culture because all cultures are learned and then decide if that's the one you wanna have. Now, God makes it possible when you're born to have as many cultures as you're exposed to as a baby. So a little Korean baby born in Brazil, Brazil can be both Korean and Brazilian, not even hard. We lose this ability about starting about the age of 10. And for most of us uh, in adulthood, it's very hard to learn to do other cultural stuff. Uh, uh, people can pick you out because you aren't doing it right. Uh, especially learning another language, you seem like you have a, a bit of an accent, you know. So it's much harder to learn as you get older. But it's not hard to appreciate. And it's certainly not hard to enjoy, participate, uh, be part of. So requires learning, uh, teaching, learning, and applying. You don't need any Indian blood to do Indian stuff. So you can be 100% not Indian and do all kinds of Indian stuff. It's irrelevant. It also means you can have 100% Indian blood and not do any Indian stuff. So culture and blood are not connected. They're simply ways of identifying. Legal. Legal, unfortunately, means you have to prove that you are Indian. And in America, proof is tribal membership. So tribal membership is simple. You are a member of a federally recognized tribe. So we already noted the different kinds of tribes. You have to be a member of one that is federally recognized. This definition is used by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The Bureau of Indian Affairs is in the Department of the Interior. This is not a definition used by the Bureau of Census. The Bureau of Census does not require any proof, but you have to have proof to be a legal Indian in America. When I'm out and about, uh, Costco, State Fair, movies back in old days, uh, if I'm out shopping and I see somebody that looks Indian, I usually ask three questions and I really do this because I like to find out if there are other Indians around, especially in Iowa, there aren't that many of us. So if I see somebody, I usually go up to them and say, hey, uh, are you Indian? Question number one. If they say yes, then I ask question number two, what tribe? And if they know their tribe so that they're not a Bureau of Census kind of Indian, that's really good that they're connected to some kind of tribe in their history. And then I ask the tricky question, are you enrolled? If they're not enrolled, they don't know what I'm talking about. If they are enrolled and they say yes, this means they're a member of that particular tribe. And if, if need be, and I don't have any reason to, they could probably show me uh, some member or some proof of membership. So those are the three kind of questions I typically ask to find out how many Indians we got you know, hanging out here in uh, my little community. I'm moving on to 
tribal memberships and demographics. And I'll give you another 10 seconds to think of anything you might, might want to put in the chat room. I had a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, are there tribes that span the United States and Canada? So are there some tribes that some of the members are now in Canada and some are in the United States? Yes. Uh, can you see me in yeah. the little corner thing? Okay. Um, that's not on the thing I was going to address in either week, either the three weeks, but I actually was thinking about that this uh, afternoon when I was hanging around in case somebody might ask them. Oh. Um, there are many tribes that are on the border, if you will. So let's pick two. Uh, a smaller tribe are called the Yaqui, Y-A-Q-U-I, in case you want to look them up. And the only reason I know about the Yaqui is because uh, my best friend is Ralph Moisa and he's Yaqui. Otherwise, I would have never heard of Yaqui. <laughs> so they're on the border of Mexico and Arizona. Their tribe literally has uh, relation, blood relations on both sides of the border. The other tribe that is bigger and more well known, you'll know the name when I say it, uh, it's up north with Canada, and that's the Mohawk. They literally have a bridge that goes across the little tiny river that divides their reservation from uh, Canada, if you're American. They have very special problems because uh, membership in the tribe sometimes means uh, you can't be Canadian or you can't, when you start talking about uh, social structure and well, what about marriages and what if the kid is born in uh, the Canadian side but you're, you're home with your, you were there with uh, your grandparents living in their house but now you've moved back to the United States and when they cut shut down the borders can you go back and forth uh, definitely true in Yaki with uh, all these border issues down south in Arizona so those those tribes are simply representative of a number of tribes there's not a lot of them uh, California has some um, a few in Washington state and a little bit going on in Montana that I'm aware of and uh, even in North Dakota, there's one tribe up there. Uh, so they're not everywhere, but there are, there are a number of tribes. You could, you could do a little research project on the number of tribes that are on the borders. Luckily, we only have the two, uh, Mexico and Canada. But yes, the answer, the answer is yes to that question. Anybody else before I move on? Okay. Tribal membership and demographics. The Bureau of Census, once again in the Department of Commerce, in 2010 said there were 309 million people in America. We're in the process of counting new for the 2020 census, but that information is not out yet. So you can look at estimates for 2000, you know, uh, 18, 2016, whatever. I just used the 2010 just for no reason. Sounds good to me. 309 million people. People who are counted by the B Department of Commerce, the Bureau of Census, they just self identify. They say, hey, I'm part Indian. And the Bureau of Census says, okay, I mark you down. And on the form, if you fill out the form, you can put a little check there in a couple of different places. You can be you know, several things in several categories. Or if they uh, call you or stop and visit with you and fill out the form kind of for you, if you will, uh, they can identify based on your responses. Um, there's a subgroup uh, of trying to identify subgroups in America that don't get filled out in these cards would be like how many students uh, in Minnesota, for example, are native, if you will use that term, if you're Indian. Um, Generally speaking, because it happened in the schools you know, when I was an administrator, you kind of just had the teachers ask the kids, you know, because we didn't really, we have a registration form. And uh, if the parent didn't fill it out, you can just ask the kids, certainly when they're older, if you're Indian, raise your hand. Or if we'll look at the registration cards, we don't require any proof to what the parent says if they mark Indian, American Indian, whatever it may be. 
Um, when you add all those numbers together in 2010, according to the Bureau of Census, who requires no proof, you get about 5 million Indians in America. 5 million. Self-identified. No proof required. The 300 tribes in America that I started out with earlier, that's culturally. That's just the, it's a simple way of trying to study these different groups of people historically. And we're going to talk about that kind of thing, I think, in uh, uh, can't remember. It must be week two. No, it's not. Yeah, it's week two when we do a barrel model of culture. So we're going to talk about these cultural tribal groupings. When you start talking about the tribal entities, however, there are 573. The Bureau of Indian Affairs counts its own figures. So using the Bureau of Census data, 309 million American Indians, and this unfortunately from our point of view as Indian people, it includes the count for Alaska Natives because the Bureau of Census puts American Indian and Alaska Natives together. So you have these categories uh, they used to be like in the 1960s the 1970s and 1980s white black hispanic uh, asian and pacific islander they put asian and pacific islander together uh, hispanic separate and then american indian alaska native have always been together and you got to choose uh, which one you wanted to be you could you could because there's once again no proof required that 5 million equals about 1.7% of the total population in 2010. So even if these were all 100% by blood Indian, there's not many of us. So that whole population is uh, 5 million. Population, I don't know what it is in Minnesota, but in Iowa, we're like 3 million people. So if you talk babies to grandparents and add them all together, you get 5 million people. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's pushing Minneapolis, St. Paul together, probably. You spread that out across the country. There's, there's just not many of us. You are lucky to run into an Indian person. So I always say, that's a good thing. How do you become a tribal member? Now that we say there's 300 tribes culturally and 573 legally, according to the BIA. Well, you have to be connected to someone on the original list that was created by the BIA. And we're going to talk about that later uh, when we talk about treaties a little bit. So you have to have some historical connection that you can literally trace back to someone who's on the original list. Then you need to know that tribes determine their own, own membership criteria. So 300 tribes or 573 tribes, each of them determines its own criteria, criteria for membership. Therefore, there's no standard membership form. Each tribe is different. Then we have to talk about um, tribes are poor. Uh, they're among the lowest on the bottom of the economic pyramid. Um, they have no money. So less than half the tribes, and it's probably really closer to less than a fourth of these tribes, have a website. They simply can't afford or have the capacity to make one. So those that do have a website, those membership criteria and forms are available on the site and you can just go and maybe download a PDF or something of the information to see if you're eligible, if you think you have tribal blood of that tribe. Otherwise, you have to contact the BIA to get information for any particular tribe that doesn't have a website or that you want to have more information on. It's traditional, not legal. It's traditional for an individual to only be a member of one tribe. So if you're multi-mixed blood, typically if you have blood from three or five different tribes, traditionally you only belong to one. So blood relations that may result in ancestors from multiple tribes means that it's uh, mixed blood. That's a term that sometimes will be heard. You have to pick a tribe. Once you apply, the, the way they kind of vote you in, and that's a good way to think of it, they vote you in, 
is basically they like you. <laughs> if they don't like you, you aren't in. That's, that's about as simple as it gets. You might meet the criteria, but if they don't like you, you're not going to get in. If you don't meet the criteria, you're not going to get in. So it's meet the criteria and they like you. Once that happens, you're in. If you're not in and you don't get in on that tribe and you have other blood from other tribes, you could try a different tribe. So we have some friends that are mixed blood who they are more culturally one tribe. They even live with this particular tribe because that's the one they culturally like. But for some reason, whatever it may be, that tribe doesn't want them. They got in on another tribe, you know, literally in another state. Even though they don't live there, they met all the criteria. And for whatever reason, that tribe said, yeah, we'll take you. So they are legally members of a federally recognized tribe, but it's not the one they want. And it's not the one they culturally live with. So the other point here, and it's a very important one, once you're in, it's extremely difficult or unusual to get out or to be let out. So I usually tell people that um, once you become a tribal member, uh, there's no divorce. You're in it for life. It's very difficult to get out or to be let out. So this concept is very important. No one can make you join a tribe. You can be 100% ancestral blood of just one tribe. And you can say, and the way I've seen it done is they cross their arms. They say, I'm not joining. I don't need the federal government telling me I'm an Indian. I already know who I am. So mm -hmm. this needs to be understood in, in terms of how people see themselves. And for some Indian people, they see the federal government is just sticking their nose in their business. So... They may be active culturally with that tribe, but for whatever reason, they're not joining. Mm -hmm. This in turn impacts the tribe in some manner, because if you get too many of them who are not a member, but are there and who are 100% Indian of that tribe, they, the tribe doesn't get any money for them, uh, for services and benefits. And we'll talk about that in week three on tribal operations. Mm -hmm. So that's tribal membership. Anybody have a question on that? Eugene, some, someone submitted the question, what happens when the parents are from two different tribes? Which, what is the baby? How does the baby's tribal affiliation get determined? There's no automatic anything. Oh. The parents have to uh, apply. So that discussion has to take place between mom and dad where should we have this uh, child be a member of what tribe? Once they make that decision, it still doesn't mean the baby's going to get in on that tribe because it's still a vote. Mm -hmm. Most tribes like babies. That's the only thing that counts. If they meet the criteria, probably they'll get in on the first tribe they choose. Um, there, I'm not sure if we're going to get into this too much in week uh, two or three, but Part of the rationale for why you may choose a particular tribe, if you have that option, is uh, whether it's matrilineal or patrilineal. Um, it's sort of like, am I going to marry a German? Or am I going to marry an Italian? Or am I going to, you know, mm -hmm. if it's German and Italian, which cultural group do you want to be most part of, if that's the case? Mm -hmm. And then you have to look at, well, what's, what's good about it? What's not good about it? Are you going to actively be involved? Do you live culturally with one of those tribes more than another? Um, the point really being there's nothing automatic. Babies don't automatically get in. They just probably have a better chance, uh, whichever uh, tribe you apply for. Okay, Indian as a name. I like this one a lot because you know, it comes up often. So politically correct. What are the options? Oh, Indian, American Indian, Native American, Indigenous, First Nation, First People. There's a whole, probably a whole bunch of others. People come up with a list. 
and everybody wants to say, well, that's the right one. Um, none of these are right. Out of this list, and we'll get to that at the end here, none of these are right. But I choose the Indian, and I want to share with you why. I have five reasons for choosing India. Reason number one, the Constitution of the United States uses the term Indian tribes. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce. Those three words, to regulate commerce, means Congress has its nose in everything we do. Banking, environment, roads, uh, health, uh, there's nothing that they don't have their hands into, including the airwaves. So phones and television, water, you name it. Those three words allow Congress to have impact on all of that. And it says with foreign nations and among the several states and with Indian tribes. So a couple of things happen here. One is the word Indian is in the Constitution. We're kind of stuck with that in, in a way. And it talks about commerce with Indian tribes. So we can maybe address some of that at some future time as well. So right, right away, the term Indian has a lot of weight for me and why I choose that term as one of the first rationales. Number two, I'm from South Dakota. Now, I don't know about Minnesota, but my guess is it's pretty much the same. We have state organizations and positions in South Dakota, my home state, a state with a high percent of Indian population, and we use the term Indian. Examples, South Dakota Indian Affairs Commissioner in the Governor's Office, South Dakota Office of Indian Education, South Dakota Indian Education Association, South Dakota State University Indian Student Organization. These don't say American Indian. These don't say Native American. They just say Indian. So that makes a lot of sense to me. It's what I've heard, it's what I've been used to, it's what I'm comfortable with. So I choose Indian because of number one and number two. Number three, federal laws overwhelmingly use Indian in the titles of significant and historical pieces of legislation. Occasionally they use the term Native American. The vast majority of historical and current legislation uses just the word Indian and sometimes American Indian. So here's some examples. The Indian Citizenship Act. It's uh, sometimes called the Snyder Act. It's gave all Indian citizenship, whether they wanted it or not, in 1924. Indian Reorganization Act, it was a way for tribes to be able to operate and become stronger because of the Indian Reorganization Act, partly because the perception at that time in the late 20s, early 30s, was that tribes were disappearing. Uh, the population was disappearing. Uh, in the 1900s to about 1920s, um, some of you may be old enough, you, you may have heard that the term was vanishing American. They were just going to disappear, but they didn't. The Indian Re Reorganization Act strengthened tribes. Sorry, Indian Child Welfare Act. That one's big in every state that has a reservation in it. So there are some people I know that work for state governments in particular who that's their main charge is to make sure that the state can deal with the Indian Child Welfare Act because it may impact uh, some families within the state. Indian Civil Rights Act. Our Indian Civil Rights Act happened in 1968. The Civil Rights Act happened in 1964. It's a coattail thing but we still have one and it's separate for us uh, and it has interesting things in it that uh, you know you wouldn't think would be there. The Indian Gaming and Regulatory Act 1988 happened in the 80s because all of a sudden casinos are popping up and states are saying what in the hell's going on you know we got Indians everywhere and they're all these people are dragging their oxygen tanks to go play casino games. 
So we had to regulate that. Well, Congress regulates all that stuff. So they passed the Indian Gaming and Regulatory Act in 1988, the Indian Religious Freedom Act, 1978. It's hard to imagine that in our country that's based on religious freedom that you have to have a separate legislative congressional uh, piece that says, oh, uh, they can have religious freedom to do what they want. And it took until 1978 to make that happen. The Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990. If you want to buy something that's made by Indians, uh, they can't be sold as Indian made unless it's made by a member of a federally recognized tribe. And they have to show proof in some manner when they you know, have that available for sale. So if you go to Malak Lakes and you want to hang out the museum shop there, um, they put little tags on and everything as to who made it. And the assumption being that that person is a legal Indian. And if you uh, buy something in some little shop downtown in some place, and they say it's Indian made, but they can't prove it, um, there are penalties that go with that. Uh, there's a nice shop, for example, in the Denver airport. I think it's called Red Horse or something like that. I bought many nice things there, not many, but some nice things there. Um, you have to ask, is it made by an Indian? They have to tell you if it is or isn't. And then literally said 573 tribes, you know, federal entities. There's a federally recognized Indian Tribe List Act, kind of updated 1994, most recent one I know of. Then you have others that use the term Native American. Uh, not very many, the most recent ones I can think of the um, Native American Language Act, um, once again, affirming that Indian languages are still okay to be taught. 1990, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990. This one's a biggie. This is where you will find many museums got caught with, well, we got stuff and now the tribes want it back. And this law says you got to give it back, work it out in some manner so that it goes back to where it belongs. Uh, 1990 is when that took effect. So reason number three is because uh, Indian is in a lot of legislation that impacts Indian people. Reason number four, there are multiple state, regional, and national organizations that use the term Indian in their name. So Bureau of Indian Affairs, it doesn't say Bureau of American Indian Affairs and it doesn't say Bureau of Native American Affairs. It's called the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, usually just abbreviated to BIA. The Indian Claims Commission within the US court system. It's called the Indian Claims Commission and still exists. The US Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. It's actually a standing committee in the Senate. The Indian Affairs. Governor's Interstate Indian Council. Uh, Indian Health Service. There are multiple organizations nationally and regionally that use the term Indian. We have organizations that sometimes use American Indian. One of the oldest groups in America, I think back in the 1930s, 40s, or 50s, somewhere in that period of time, they, they organized and they're called the National Congress of American Indians. They know a lot of stuff. Uh, they're kind of like the AAA, the AARP of our people. They've been around for a long time. They know things. The brand new uh, guy on the block is the National Museum of the American Indian. It's the last I've heard, the newest museum. I know they're building another one. Uh, the newest museum on the mall in Washington, D.C. Beautiful structure. They have events, information, uh, galleries, all kinds of stuff. The American Indian Science and Engineering Society, they've been around a long time, since the 70s, I believe. And they're probably more active now because of STEM and STEAM um, than whatever other ones may exist that are promoting technology. The American Indian Higher Education Consortium. I don't know if I'll have time to get into this ever, but there are tribal colleges, there are colleges that a focus on American Indian topics and so forth. And a lot of them uh, use this organization as a way to connect with others. And finally, the one I, uh, Native American Rights Fund, it's the only Native American term that I know of. 
but they're in Boulder, Colorado. They're really just a bunch of lawyers and all they do is work for tribes. I always thought if I was going to be an attorney once and I thought if I was, that's who I want to work for, Native American Rights Fund, because they have a weird, really weird name and nobody knows what that means. But what it really means is they're a bunch of attorneys and all they do is represent tribes. So that's part of rationale, you know, number four, why I choose Indian. But there's one important one, the most important one, number five, mom. Our tribe, Dakota, is matrilineal. The most important person in the family is grandma. I, my mom says Indian. I can't tell my mom she's wrong. I can't say, mom, that's not, that's not right. That's what mom says. That is right. <coughs> my mom always said Indian. She never said American Indian. She never said Native American. So that's what I do. And that's what I will continue to do. And those five reasons are the reasons why I choose Indian. But the reality is, since all of those are just misnomers, the only thing that matters is tribe. If you don't have a tribal connection, if you don't know who your tribe is, then you're just an Indian wannabe. So Indian doesn't mean anything. It's just a nice term that we use to help describe ourselves. But the meat of who we are is based on what tribe we belong to. Questions on that? We'll give you a few seconds at least. I'm going to move on to a constitutional foundation of tribal sovereignty. Tribal sovereignty means the exercise of rights. So sovereignty means I can do this because I have that right. And we think about it in terms of countries. If I'm France, I can do this because I'm France. If I'm Brazil, I can do this because I'm Brazil. We don't allow others to tell us what to do because it's our sovereign right to do what we want to do. Nobody has a right to tell us what to do. Well, tribes have sovereignty. This is problematic in America. <laughs> so let's talk about that a little bit. Well, tribal sovereignty kind of hinges on the U.S. Constitution. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 created the special relationship with tribes. Congress ended up being in charge of all of that. Well, there's a need to have a mechanism to administer what Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 says, regulate things. So the executive branch created the Bureau of Indian Affairs to do this, administer the laws that Congress passes. A lot of these things started before federal, or excuse me, tribal governments existed when treaties were created. So the executive branch, the, the office of the president, that's who makes treaties. The legislative branch approves them. So in particular, just the Senate. So if for some reason, president has a treaty made with somebody someplace, but it doesn't get approved by the legislative branch, the Senate, then there is no treaty. You gotta start over, you gotta start from scratch. So when treaties are generated and approved by the legislative branch, many of them later on, especially in the um, mid 1800s, many of them created reservations and simply because we lost the war. Tribes lost and were being placed in places they had no choosing of. So these were called reservations, uh, areas of land that were taken that were reserved just for those um, Indian people who once lived on that land. In Canada, they're literally called reserves, they're not called reservations. So the BIA needed to know who's supposed to be here. Who's supposed to be on this reservation? So they made a list and they put down people's names. And when you were on that list, then that's an enrollment list. And it's very similar to the enrollment list that you get when you're teaching a class. Until you show up, you're not enrolled. But once you show up and we put your name on that list, you're enrolled in that class. And you're technically then can be absent because you're enrolled and now you're gone. 
But if you're not on that list, you're not enrolled. They need to know who is supposed to be on this reservation. So they created an enrollment list for each reservation. They maintain those lists since the creation of the reservation in the mid 1800s. The list means well, so-and-so died, I gotta check them off. So-and-so got married, did they marry another Indian? If they did, I gotta put those together and make sure I, who, if they had children, who those people are. Then later on, if those kids ended up marrying somebody else over here, then I gotta, they track all of that. That's their job to know who is part of this reservation. This list, creates a trust responsibility between the tribes and the federal government. The tribes need to know who's supposed to get some of the things the treaties agreed to. You have to be on the list, which means somehow you have to be connected to somebody so you can be enrolled on that reservation or in that tribe, because not all tribes have reservations. Tribal sovereignty and enrollment. Enrolled individuals are member of a federally recognized tribe. The BIA is still tracking people in case they do become members. And so those are called registered. So it's just like taking a class. You register for the class, but until you actually show up, you're not enrolled. They have to track everybody who potentially could be an enrolled member, who would potentially meet the requirements of being a member of that tribe. Until the advent of computers in the 50s, they're doing this by hand. This is a mess in many regards, and people often try to challenge their, their clarity and the authenticity of what they've got for their list. So for tribal enrollment, tribes have the sole right to determine who are their members. Enrollment populations are considerably lower than the Bureau of Census figure, five million. We're doing guesstimates to a certain extent, uh, because enrollment changes as registered people become enrolled or as babies become enrolled who weren't counted last week. The enrollment number, uh, population number is probably around two to three million. So it's even a smaller percentage of the total population in 2010 as it's going to be in 2020. It's not going to grow any. So tribal sovereignty, to focus on that, Congress has plenary power over tribes. This really needs to be understood clearly. Plenary means total and complete. They can say by a vote, 24 seven, 365 and a quarter days a year, by a vote, you're not a tribe like that. And you're not. They can say by a vote anytime they want. That club of unrecognized people, you you are a tribe like that. They have total tr control over tribes, plenary power. So laws passed by Congress are administered by the executive branch, typically and because it's every department has some connection to tribal members. The Department of the Interior Bureau of Indian Affairs has a vast responsibility of most of these laws administering them. But you can look at justice, you can look at agriculture, you can look at health and human services, Homeland Security, uh, Department of State. They all have some connection with uh, enrolled tribal members in federally recognized tribes. So in essence, congressional pieces of legislation establish dual citizenship for tribal members who are citizens of the state they're in, but subject to other congressional legislation that other state citizens are not. It is a dual citizenship sort of status. The activity by the BIA to carry out legislation is called trust responsibility. They're supposed to do it on our behalf. This is not easy. The BIA is responsible for, for providing goods and services promised in treaties and in congressional legis legislation. Congress usually uh, appropriates monies to do so. Tribes operate as governments recognized by the federal government. That's important. Tribes operate as governments recognized by the federal government. The government to government relationship carried out by the BIA on behalf of the uh, federal government is a trust responsibility. 
And because trust responsibility can be both positive and negative from the tribe's point of view, this creates a love-hate relationship between the BIA and tribes. We want the BIA to do this for us. And the BIA says, well, you have to do this too. And sometimes neither one of them want to do either one of the things. So it's, it's a tricky relationship. You can physically see this relationship when you visit a reservation because they don't they don't hang out in the same building there's a building for the tribe for its government its tribal council then you go across the street or go on the sidewalk to the building for the BIA where the BIA exists and lives and works they're side by side they may even be part of the same building but typically they're not they're two different groups it is truly a love-hate relationship there are issues. Issues generally revolve around disagreements between tribes and states over the exercise of tribes' sovereign rights in a state. So you can imagine if you're in a state and the tribe's saying, well, we're going to do this. And the state says, no, you're not. It's against state law. And the tribe says, eh, who cares? That causes a problem. When these kind of issues surface, there's usually only two ways to resolve them. One is by legislative action. Congress has total plenary power over tribes. They can, they can change the rules if they wish. Or it can be challenged and at some point maybe goes all the way to the Supreme Court. This happens a lot historically in the past 200 years. If it goes to the Supreme Court, the resolution there is usually uh, what, what's called uh, the three-prong approach. It's not a real thing. Uh, it's not a policy, it's not a doctrine, it's sort of like a retrospect. It's kind of a reflection. It, it seems to be this way when you review these uh, decisions by the Supreme Court. So the three-prong approach uh, determines who has the right or power, the tribe or the state, to do something in a state. That's where the problem usually arises. So basically it says, if we're talking about a particular right, um, in the instance, I think it's, uh, is it next week? Yeah, we talked about casinos. I'm looking at my little next week list. Yes, we're going to talk about casinos. That's a right. Somebody has laws against it or for it or whatever. If the tribe wants to have casinos, can they? Can they do that? Well, when you review that, the three things you look at, was that right taken away by a treaty? And it must be specifically identified in the treaty because that's what lawyers do. It's got to be specific. Was that right given away by the tribe at some point? Did the tribe say, hey, we don't ever want to do casinos ever, ever, ever. We wrote that down. We'll sign it. It's like a confession. Did they give it away? Was it taken away by legislative action by Congress who has plenary power over tribes? If any of those things are true, then they don't have that right. But if none of those things are true, they didn't have it taken away by treaty, it wasn't given away by the tribe, and Congress didn't take it away, then the tribe has or retains that right. This is problematic in states. These rights are the basis of tribal sovereignty and the reason for the existence of trust responsibility conducted by the BIA, part of that love-hate relationship. The exercise of these rights has and continues to create friction between tribes and the states in which the tribes are located. And I guarantee you, you have friction in Minnesota because of tribal sovereignty issues. Because every place there's a tribe and a state, they clash constantly. I can do this. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. And until it gets resolved either by Congress or through um, Supreme Court judicial decisions, it's a problem. So that's essentially tribal sovereignty, the short version. And we're going to talk more specifically about other things. I'm looking at my clock and I'm saying 753. Is that about what you're saying too? Yeah. So there okay. are a few questions. Okay. So someone asks, if tribes are sovereign, how can there be legislation affecting them? Because the Supreme Court says tribes are subject to the laws of Congress. That, that took a big, that was a big hassle in the 1830s, essentially. 
So the Supreme Court, uh, John Marshall in particular, used this term that nobody knows what it means, a domestic dependent nation. Okay. What's that? Well, that's what they're called legally at times. And it just means, yeah, they have sovereign status, but they're dependent on us for anything they do. Another question is, uh, do tribes in other countries have their have control or as much oversight by their governments? I do not know the answer to that. Uh, I purposefully, uh, I'm overwhelmed by information on America. <laughs> and uh, I only know a few things on Canada, like so minimal. If you ask me three things, that's about all I know. I know nothing about Mexico or Central America. So I have to defer an answer to that because I simply don't know. And one, one last question. Um, how, how do the tribal, how do they determine who's going to deal with the BIA on, on the different tribes? Who do, how do they create their governments? And do they get to, they just decide who's, how they're going to create their own governing body? If I'm understanding the question, is it, is it as you interpret it, uh, how, who's picked to work with the yeah, BIA? That's it. That's what it is. Uh, we'll talk a little, little bit about that, a little more about it, perhaps maybe in tribal operations, government operations. But Two things. Number one, it varies by tribe. Every single tribe is different. And number two, it depends on what picture you're taking at what time. Are you talking about 1860s, 1920s, 1950s, 1980s, 2017? Sure. Every historical connection impacts who, what, and how that's done. Uh, so there unfortunately is no simple answer to that one. Um, also, to some extent, depends on how big the tribe is. What is their capacity uh, to generate someone who has the ability to work with the political process that is involved in working with the BIA. Not a simple thing when until the 1950s, nobody was graduating from high school. So you're talking about capacity building here to a great degree. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the four minutes I have, I'm only gonna to touch on one of the things here because I think I can, and I want to really get you involved and in, we can do uh, the other part of this later, uh, some cultural traditions because Indian things are cultural. Uh, there were going to be th three things, but we're just going to look at quill work. Uh, quill work, before white contact, plains tribes and woodland tribes created decorations using porcupine quills. Creating quill, quill work was a very tedious task. This form of decoration was easily replaced after white contract, contact when white people, French fur traders in particular, uh, traded beads for fur. And the fur is another important thing that America's first millionaire was John Jacob Astor. You can make a million bucks on fur back in those days. So quill work got replaced by bead work. So bead work is new. Quill work is old. Quill work tends to be focused on plains tribes and woodland tribes in Eastern America. So. The quill is sharp on both ends. You got to cut off the sharp ends. It's hollow like a straw. You can dye it with color. You can string sinew to make necklaces and earrings out of multiple little pieces. For example, here's it's sharp and pointy and they have barbs on the end. The, the porcupine has to actually, you got to get it stuck in your flesh. Then it gets pulled out like hair and there's a follicle on the other end. So this little follicle down at the bottom that gets hard too, because it got pulled, pulled out of the porcupine. They don't throw them, they get pulled out. Well, you can't find a whole lot of quill just laying around. So you actually have to kill the porcupine to get the quills. But once you get those, you can cut off the sharp ends. They're hollow like a straw, dye them with color and string them with sinew for necklace and earrings. So here are the clipped off small porcupine quills. They're hollow. You clipped off the sharp ends, you ran sinew through the middle, and you put a bunch of them together. You got a necklace, you got some earrings, you can throw together as well. And that's a simple way to use the quilts. You can make it harder by flattening them out. So when we talk about 
flatten by pulling them through your teeth. You don't cut the sharp ends off now. You pull them through your teeth. You wrap them around hard strips of leather. And when you do that, you have these individual porcupine quills. Imagine how many quills it takes to do this little wrapping because they're just wrapped. This is the finished side. This is the working side. So on the back, all the quills are tucked under each other. So it looks pretty on one side and it's a piece of work on the other side because it's a lot of work to make this happen. Because, I'm gonna have to put that back at some point, braid, uh, the wrapped around, there's no sewing on wrapped or plated decorated objects. They're not sewn on, they're just wrapped and they've tucked underneath each other. There's another technique called uh, plating, which is sort of like braiding. Now you don't wrap around a piece of leather, you just wrap around anything you want. Plating is a very complicated technique and you don't find it much anymore. So another showy side, but uh, you can have quill work on a hair tie like this. And there, everything where you see the quills means it's wrapped around a strip of leather. And there's a working side as well as the show side. This is a bison horn spoon. And now this is plated. This is wrapped around the horn. It's not wrapped around a piece of leather. This is how tight that wrapping becomes. It is so tight, it's pretty much unbelievable. So I just wanted to share that with you with uh, uh, about quill work, and we'll talk about more of that. So I'm gonna go down here to end of part one. These are our dogs when they're little. So I am open to questions. If you are time run out, that's whatever you want. I'm back to wherever we are. <laughs> well, great. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Eugene. Yeah, uh, if, um, everyone should be expecting to receive a, um, a survey uh, in, the e in your email from today's program, and I encourage you to sign up for the next couple weeks for the next two programs. And uh, Eugene said he's open if anybody has a question now at the end. Otherwise, thank you all for attending. Um, I know we all learned a lot.